I just turned 25 and to help me determine what I want for the next 10 years of my life, I asked a few people who I admire to write letters to their younger selves to learn from them. This is how that went. Another episode of A Letter to My Younger Self, a podcast where we encourage you to work hard, have good intentions, and most importantly, trust the process. I am your host, Maxine Wabosha. And in life, we tend to have this idea of a path that we think we are destined to follow. It could be that you're in college, you feel like you're in love, and this is a person you're going to spend the rest of your life with jokes on you. <laughs> it could be a job that you have found. You feel like it's going to be your forever job. You are going to get so much money from this job, a lot of fulfillment from it. But you know, as the saying goes, we plan and God laughs. So today's guest is a member of the coolest YouTube squad ever that we all secretly wish we were in. Her name is Ivy Mugo and she is going to share with us pockets of her life today. How are you, Ivy? Excellent. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Such a pleasure. Yeah. And a random fact, I don't know if you know this, but I was in a theater group with your brother. What are you saying? Miles. Uh, yeah. I, did, I think you mentioned. Yeah. I didn't mention the theater group. Yes, we were the theater group. We used to go to the club <laughs> and everything. But then kind of fell out. How is Miles doing? Miles okay. doing extremely well. He's actually around for the holidays yeah. in case you guys want to meet or whatever you guys do when you're talking about it. But he's around. He's doing very well. Okay. Yeah. I have to mention I'm a huge fan, especially on TikTok. Creativity level insane. I have to mention the same. Um, when I was, who was I telling? Edgar, a friend of mine called Edgar that we're uh-huh. having a podcast with Bobosha. Because you're huge. <laughs> you're, like, you're famous. You're a superstar. So uh-huh. just, and you also, yeah, that's your old people look at you and we're like, oh, <laughs> oh the good old days. So yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so yeah. much. I think now you can go ahead and read us your letter. Oh, I read it, yeah? Yes. All right. So... <clears throat> Hello, 24-year-old Ivy. Let's start with your career. You will keep at this client service thing you've got going and actually get pretty decent at it. You will get a job that will expose you, but break you, silence you, test you, but you will rise. Most recently, you are the CST, which means client service director. In brackets, yeah, Ivy, you did it. Of an upcoming digital and below the line agency. Good money, good environment, good training. Things got a bit crazy, though, after a global pandemic caused by a virus named Corona. We're using past tense here because you quit your job to pursue your love for social media marketing. Yes, Ivy, you quit a high-paying job in the middle of a pandemic when everyone else is actively looking for work. Long story short, you're over 30 years old. You don't have as much money to spend, but you are happy. And this is when your career is beginning. Your love life. I know what you think what you have right now is love, but mama, it's not. I know your gut tells you that something is off and that there's better out there. Well, you you wouldn't trust that instinct. And you suffer a great deal of physical, emotional, and financial pain in the name of love. But it makes you stronger. It makes you wiser. It makes you bold. And we take risks that pay off. As you speak, you are experiencing the joy of being loved for who you truly are. Your Your assertiveness, your ambition, all the things you think are wrong with you, turns out they are all the things that are right. Your stories will inspire and teach young girls to live for themselves. Girl, you even end up on TEDx with your best friends. I mean, come on. Did I mention you're a mom? You have twins now. Twins. You. It's funny once you think about it, isn't it? These, you have gorgeous little girls who adore the ground you walk on. Unfortunately, you suffer postpartum stress. Not many will understand your lonely journey, but you will pull through with the support of your family. Now, Ivy, your family is king. I cannot stress that enough. I want to close this letter by telling you that you are enough. You may be down right now. Your self-esteem may be in the dumps, but your character will rise. You will stop thinking about what others think of you and work on what you think of yourself. Life's good, babe. Love, 32-year-old Ivy. While reading that was... Interesting. Yeah, um, brought back a lot. Yeah. Um, so currently I'm 24 yeah. and you wrote to your 24-year-old self. My brother Miles told me, um, yeah. well, Bosch is 24, write to her 24-year-old, yeah. write to your 24-year-old self. So give me that idea. Ah, yeah. okay. So um, apart from now your brother giving you the idea, is there any other thing that stood out about being 24? Like is there anything specific that happened at 24 that stood out for you? Oh, yeah, tons of things. Um, 
I think I was doing very well for myself career wise, but mm-hmm. my Ivy as a self, as a human being, was completely lost and uh, completely sad. Yeah. And it's those those scenarios where out there people think you're very happy. Yeah. Um, but uh, I was sad. I was sad. Mm-hmm. That's why I think right into my 24 year old self was um, important because right now I'm happier. And I feel like she needed to know that it can get better. Yeah. Um, but what was causing the sadness? Um, I think I had a lot of tension in a relationship that I was in mm-hmm. at the time mm-hmm. uh, where I lost myself. You know, young ladies, sometimes you committed to relationships 150%, but yeah. you don't get the same. So I think I had I was in such a scenario, um, spending money on a man, which is <laughs> ridiculous. Um, and... I think maybe right now I can confirm that it was a bit emotionally and also mentally abusive because I remember being in that relationship, I felt extremely stupid because it's something that was told to me over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. And I didn't think that um, I'd get any better. And it's something else that I was told. Yeah. I mean, it's This is it. I read it's you, me against the world. I mean, there's nothing else uh, for you out there. If you can't live with me, who else will you live with? So um, a personal relationship really contributed to my sadness during this time. Okay. Yeah. But you also talk about like there was emotional yeah. and physical yeah. parts of it. Did it yeah. get like heartbreak physical is, with it? Heartbreak is very physical. Yeah. Uh, painful. So I think that's what I can see. Heartbreak is physically painful, and you know, abortion if you're crying every day, yeah, hey, it hurts, huh? It, it really does. Oh, it, hurts. It, it doesn't make any sense to just cry every day like that. So, that's the physical pain, I think, that um, you're referring I'm talking to. About. Yeah. Okay, um, and I mean, as we all know, this man they embarrass you, they do, they have tendencies to embarrass you yeah. in the streets. Yeah. When you talk about financial, yeah. like financially, how was it? Is it that you moved in with this guy mm-hmm. and then you ended up funding him? Because mm-hmm. I mean, there are tons of stories out mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. Just the other day, a friend of mine was telling me how someone paid for a whole degree, mm-hmm. you can imagine, okay. <laughs> and was left literally, you know, a yeah. few days after. Yeah. So how was that for you? Yeah, um, yeah, definitely that. I remember we were shooting an episode of About 5 recently where Julia said she left a duvet at a man's house that she had mm. bought for this guy. And the edit that didn't make it to the end video is I had said, I've left a PlayStation, a microwave, uh, um, what do you call it? A home theater system. I paid more than half of the TV. Some of these things you just leave yeah. them so that you can just go. So yes, I funded <laughs> a, a lot bit of this guy's life. You know, those things of even giving a guy money under the table so yeah. that you can have drinks and impress your friends and that type of stuff. I did all that stupidity yeah. thinking that... Um, this is what the relationship needed and thinking that he'd, he'd, you know, respect me more and that we're a team. And, you know, I didn't mm-hmm. want it to look like, uh, you know, he had nothing. I needed it to look like he's the man. That's yeah. absolute nonsense. I'd like to tell women that you are the man. man. Like that's, that's, <laughs> that was complete nonsense for me. Yeah. So I did fund a bit of a human being's life that mm-hmm. I really should not have. Yeah. yeah. So ladies, if you're watching this, don't buy that PS5. It's not worth it. Yeah. Or if <laughs> you do, uh-huh. you take it back. When you leave it. Oh, yeah, my friend. <laughs> How would that conversation be like, like, hi, yeah, he sees the PS5, I bought you. Yeah. Here's the receipt. It's mine. It's mine. It's take it mine. back. Oh, you take it back. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So at the time yeah. you mentioned that that's the time you were working for client service, yeah? Yes. Um, what exactly does that entail? Okay. Um, client service is a role that is mostly in agencies, marketing agencies. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so... What you do is you're the go between the client, the suppliers, and um, whatever else is happening within the agency. Mm-hmm. So you're meaning a communication channel. Um, where I had gotten to, where where I said recently I'd left, uh, when when I can say I was a client service director, now that means I work on strategy, so brand strategy. So if a company, let's say like, um, what company can I mention? A shoe company comes to me and tells me they want to market their shoes for a year. I come up with that strategy um, to guide how those shoes will be marketed for a year. Mm-hmm. So that's basically what client service is. Okay, yeah. so um, when you think back yeah. at like Ivy when she was even younger, yeah. is it something that you feel like you wanted to do all your life yeah. or you just found yourself in that career? Oh no, I did not imagine that I would be in agency at yeah. all. Agency is a very interesting environment. I don't even know what I wanted. No, actually, no, I'm very clear what I wanted because I'm doing it now. Mm-hmm. It was, I did not imagine it at all. Do I appreciate the training The training I got mm-hmm. from doing it? A hundred percent. But it's not what I pictured myself doing. It's a lot of work. Very high pressure. Mm-hmm. Very high pressure. You can deal with people who tell you F off to your face and yeah. throw your things and it was it was a bit high pressure 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you also mentioned that the job was really draining. Yeah. How how was it draining mm. for you? This was a particular a particular instance um, when I had moved from a very good working environment and a very good agency to another one, mm-hmm. um, where I realized my assertiveness and my voice was slowly starting to be silenced because speaking out, um, let me not say against, but trying to voice my opinion um, on a certain issue um, was not taken very well. Mm-hmm. It was those agencies where what the boss says is what, what the boss says. And that's not who Ivy is. Mm-hmm. So I came to realize after working there for a whole year, um, I'll never forget my f- my first ever brainstorm. I was very active. I was very lively. I was Ivy. I was doing what Ivy was supposed yeah. to do, giving out the ideas to my last brainstorm where I just used to keep quiet, hold my notebook, and whatever I'm told to do, I do. You, you wanted to go where? All right, fine. You want what in the event? Okay, fine. That's okay with me. What color do you want? In? I just yeah. stopped thinking. So I lost a huge piece of myself in employment, which mm-hmm. is a bit um, crazy. And that's even... And it's at that juncture where I actually got pregnant. So it was just not a very good environment to be in at the yeah. time. Employment and I can imagine, I mean, like for a creative, yeah. you know, we thrive when we can think about ideas and watch them come to life. Exactly. So having yourself feel like you're being suppressed, yeah. it, it must, it it must be a lot. part of me. It yeah. took a, a part of me. And I could not recognize myself. It was sad. Okay, yeah. so um, after how long did you get to level up, like, and get it was the C, CSD, yes. yeah. After um, let me say around maybe two to three, two to three years, because yeah. I left that, I left that job and uh, um, yeah, got another one, um, not really entry level but management level, and then I rose up the ranks. So let me say around two to three years for me to get to the position of client service director, which for me is a big deal because I know the first time I ever came into agency, I uh-huh. knew that is the role I wanted, if yeah. not the managing director. Because to get to the managing director role, the client service director is almost very close to it. So when I got that promotion, I was like, ah, yes. This is it. Yes, this is it. So how do you go from this is it to I quit? I'm done. Oh, my dear. I'm not doing this oh, anymore. My oh, my dear. I've never quit a job that I enjoy so much. Like yeah. this previous job, I, I I really, 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 really loved it. Uh, but then Corona, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, with Corona means salaries were slashed. Yeah. And, and full full disclosure, my salary was slashed in half, like as soon as Corona hit half. Mm-hmm. But my expenses are still the same. My rent yeah. is the same. My kids still need to eat. I still have employees. I still have a life to run. Um. So because I'm a very, I'm a mover, I decided not to wallow for too long. And then luckily I'd already started doing social media on the side mm-hmm. and it had started to, um, become, you know, become something yeah. good. So I put more effort into the social media side and into this social media amplification. I really don't want to call myself an influencer. And I saw the effort start to pay off. And one of the biggest things for me is I realized the work I get, I don't look for it. Mm-hmm. I get called yeah. to work. So I just sat down one day and thought, what if I asked? Yeah. What if I actually asked for work? How would it go? And that is the day I wrote a proposal for one of my current clients. I just sat down, wrote a proposal and asked for a very expensive appliance. <laughs> and I sent it to a number of people. They mm-hmm. did not respond. But that one company did respond and I, I got their plans. I'm like, these proposals I've been writing for all these other clients for all these years, I can write them for myself and, yeah. and get this work and get the money and get probably more than I make now. I thought about it for a few months, a couple of months, talked to some friends. Mm-hmm. The last person I spoke to was my mom. I said, mom, mom, I feel like I'm sleeping on myself. Yeah. I feel like what I'm doing can become better. And also at work, because I am a marketer, there was a lot of conflict. I could not work on a certain brand. I could not, yeah. you know, because it's conflicting with the agency. So when I told my mom that, she was like, Shiro, I think you should quit. I yeah. think you should just trust in yourself and and leave. And once your mom tells you something like that, uh, the go ahead you need. <laughs> the go ahead you need. The next week, I'd handed in my resignation letter. Yeah. Scared as scared as hell. I had stomach issues for like a whole week. <laughs> um, I even cried um, at some point. I was shaking. Mm-hmm. I remember my fiance was like, "Oh." <laughs> He's never seen me like that because I was crying on his chest like a, a girl. Yeah. I kept remembering 
the salary that's no longer coming, but uh, that's how I ended up quitting my job. Before we continue, I'd like to say a big, big thank you for all the support that you have shown myself and this podcast so far. If you'd like to support this podcast even more, you can do so by purchasing one of your favorite A Letter to My Younger Self merch. We have journals, and these journals have quotes as well as thought-provoking questions that will be able to guide you in your own personal journey. We also have mugs, bags, webcam covers, and a lot, lot more. What I will do is I will leave a link down below in the description box where you can go and check this out for yourselves. Now back to the podcast. Ah, yeah. that's interesting. You yeah. see, actually, because I was really thinking about it, yeah. and if you really look into 2020, yeah. all of this really, really bad things yeah. happened. Yeah. But the thing is, like one of my favorites, is it like a saying or a quote, yeah. is that sometimes God makes you uncomfortable so that you can move. Yeah, and so I feel like what 2020 forced us to do is move, mm-hmm. like quite literally. It was just like, listen, this is not working. You need to get out of it. So now, do you think if it was not for Rona and the payment being slashed into half, do you think you would have quit the job? Maybe not this year. Yeah, but it's eventually. something that eventually, for sure, because mm-hmm. my passion for social media amplification is is true, and you, it's something that I can't ignore. But mm-hmm. definitely not this year. I would not have quit in the middle of a pandemic. I'd have worked it out, maybe quit a year or so from now. But definitely, I think Rona to be perfect. Yeah, yeah. I you do. know that social media amplifier thing. I think it's something I need to start taking. Yeah, because I hate the word influencer. Yeah. And I think it's because also at the time that I was getting into influencing, the influencers were guys who would be paid to go to the club and sit there. So those were who I knew as influencers. Yeah. So people started calling me an influencer. I was like, no, I'm not. Yeah. You're a That's media not house. me. That's who I am. I'm a, I'm a media house. Yeah. I'm a small mini KTN or a small mini BBC. That's who I am. That's what I think I am. Okay. Yeah. So now you talk about how now um, you've quit. Mm-hmm. You don't have this constant salary that mm-hmm. is coming mm-hmm. in. Mm-hmm. But then um, before that, you had this well-paying job. And now you're... And at, no, at that time, you were still a YouTuber. You have the well-paying job. And then now that you've quit that, you still have the social media things that you're doing. Yeah. Now, people out there have this mindset that if you're in social media doing this thing, you're rich. You know, you're just rolling in dough. Uh, you have all this money because, I mean, how are you online? You're um, online. Oh how my, how yes. does that work? Yeah. <laughs> so... How how is that? It's yeah, it's hard. Huh? I miss my salary. <laughs> I miss my salary. Yeah, but I don't miss the mindset that it put me in because I feel like my salary enslaved me. Mm-hmm. So what I appreciate about uh, social media amplification right now is that I think big, and I know that if I don't work, I won't eat, and my kids won't eat. Um, it's 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 hard. Mm-hmm. Right now, I believe I'm in a stage where I'm building my brand so that I, I can demand the money and the compensation and the type of training by brands that I would appreciate. But uh, it's hard out here. And mm-hmm. I also don't think that social media amplification is being taken very seriously by brands. It's one of those things that, oh, it's just an influencer. I give them like a 50K yeah. to post on their page. Yeah. But for me, what I know that I bring to the table that's a bit different is that I have 10 years of marketing experience behind me. Mm-hmm. So I understand strategy with brands and things that I'm, that I'm supposed to do with a brand very yes. differently from a lady who, I don't want to say a lady, a gentleman who twerks. Let's not stereotype. <laughs> yeah. No, from a gentleman who twerks. So... Right now, brand building, money is not, it's not a lot of money mm-hmm. if you really, really, really think about it. If I look at all the LPOs I've gotten and the contracts I've signed, it's not that much money, but there's a lot of effort you have to put in now to build your brand so that you can get to the point where if you say, and if you sit and say 250, 250K for a post and you sit down and they say, okay, fine, we'll make it work. Yeah. The other thing I've also realized is clients give out money for very good ideas. If the idea is good and they see your passion and yeah. your attitude for the same is positive, they give you that money. But let, let's not fool people that there's money out here. Yeah, mm, Money is out there to be made, yes, but uh, no, it doesn't come that easy. You have to work for yeah, it. You have to, you have to be it. smart yeah. how to get it. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've experienced the payment term issues, which is yeah. something I'm a bit, I'm like, oh, my days. Because I track my payment <laughs> and you work in July and then you're paid in August. Oh, I'm like, this yeah. is ridiculous. So those are some of the things I'm trying to just manage. 90 right days now. after. You're like, but the work is done. You, yeah, you're enjoying my media. Like, <laughs> 
I mean, it's ridiculous. It's a bit it ridiculous. Yeah. Okay, so now you're a mom of like two beautiful girls. Okay. And I swear, I see the pictures and I have to be like, ovaries, relax. Mm-hmm. You know, Bali diapers. Bali. Bali diapers. I so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so how, how is it? How is the experience being a mom of twins? Yeah. And at what age did you have them? Um, I had my girls. Not that three and a half. So I think I was about maybe 20 seven years old, mm-hmm. 28 years old. Um, it's amazing. Let me not lie. I, I, I walk around with my chest very hard because I'm like, yeah. I'm I did a, that. I'm a twin mom. <laughs> I'm a twin mom. Oh, you have one child. I'm a twin mom. I know. I feel very good about it. But if it's something I promised myself and other people mm-hmm. is that I would never romanticize motherhood for anybody because that's, it was romanticized for me too much. I feel like I went in um, thinking it's going to be one thing, but it was completely something else. A different thing. It's it's hard. It's hard. In yeah. Life. It's it's hard. It's mentally exhausting. Mm-hmm. It's financially draining. It's I don't physically even the pain yeah. from a C-section and and healing while you have two babies then sucking you dry from your titties. It. I will not romanticize motherhood. Carrying a baby, I always say, I can carry 10 babies. You want me to carry a child? Fine. Raising mm-hmm. them thereafter, I imagine. That's you know, where the work that's is. Where the, that's where the true work is. That's who I believe a true mother is. Is, is it an achievement to carry a baby to full time and give birth to them 100,000%? Mm-hmm. But for me, is it a big achievement to do that and raise someone who's respectful and kind and happy? Yeah. I think that's what motherhood truly is. Okay. Um, how did you find out you're pregnant, if you don't mind sharing? Oh, I don't mind sharing. Um, oh, wait. How did I? Oh, God. Let me see if I can remember. Um, my period was late. Uh-huh. Uh, and I called my best friend. She's called Kashiko. I called her. I'm like, I think my period is late. I need to take a, a test. Mm-hmm. She says, okay, by the test. Um, and we have this rule where if you think you're pregnant, you don't tell the man first. You mm-hmm. talk to each other first. Find out if it's true because there's no need of making a man go into panic over these yeah. things. So I bought a test. I have taken a pregnancy test before. Come on, in uni, let's be honest about these things. I have never seen two lines appear so fast <laughs> in my life. It was literally the peach, um, like, crap. I'm um, quite it's... pregnant. So I took a photo and sent it to her. I was like, okay, so this is happening. And then I told the guy, mm-hmm. after telling the guy, um, he says this, I mean, I said, let's go to a doctor officially to confirm the pregnancy. Mm-hmm. Uh, we went actually to Nairobi Women's, which is one closest to where you are, and uh, it was confirmed that I was pregnant. And that's how I found out I was pregnant with one child. Ooh, yeah. plot twist. Plot twist. After how plot long twist. did you find so out was five weeks. Weeks. Yeah, so I go there, we're told, uh, ultrasound, oh yeah, you're five weeks pregnant, congratulations. This is how it lo- uh, the, the baby looks like. And at that time, I'm like, oh my God, I'm not really for a child. But it's fine. We move regardless. Yeah. Um, I move on with tests, whatever. And throughout, my mom would keep telling me, I need to go. Your stomach is big. Are you sure that's one child? I'm like, mom, but here's a scan. Like, yeah. it is one child. What's the problem? So at 12 weeks, we go to a hospital that I hadn't uh, regularly been going for. Some uh, We have specialized um, uh, specialists there, so I wanted a, a second ultrasound at 12 weeks. So I go there, she's doing the thing on the belly, and then she says, oh, so because this is a twin pregnancy, you know what we need to do? So I, I was like, what the? <laughs> so I actually asked her, do you start your sessions with jokes? Because that's not funny. That's not funny. She's like, no. Then she turns the monitor towards me and says, that's the first fetus and that's the second fetus. And I remember turning to look at Lee and I burst out laughing. (laughs) I burst out laughing. Laughed, 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 laughed. Laughed even out of the hospital. I I was just, I went a bit nuts for a little bit. And then that's how I found out I was pregnant with twins. Like a joke. Wow. So because it was not, not, nothing dramatic, nothing. It was just, they're here. <laughs> and and uh, I don't know, like what, what were your feelings at that time? Hey, fear. Yeah? Fear, because my sister had just had a baby like a year ago. Mm-hmm. And I know how stressful it is to have a baby. So it was complete utter fear. And also a deep confusion because I wonder, I wondered why me? Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not religious really, but I remember I even asked my mom, can we go to church? Because I was like, why was I selected for this honor? There are people who can't have children. And I'm a wild child. I'm always yeah. partying. I'm, I'm always partying. I'm always drinking. I did not expect to be a mother. I did not plan for it till I mean, after 30. So a bit of confusion in that. Why am I being blessed with this mm-hmm. honor? Um, I think those were my immediate feelings. Yeah. 
And did you feel like in any way it would uh, uh, affect like your job situation definitely, at the time? Yeah, definitely. did it? Yes. Yeah, in ah, what yeah. way? Um, remember, at this time is when I was in a very stressful job. Yeah. Um, my, my job entailed me to travel all over the country. It was very high. I was constantly moving. I was never in Nairobi, which is even one of the reasons I missed out on the first episodes of Over 25, because I was in Eldor Toxinu or somewhere. And it was in events. And I'm energetic, so I was constantly running up and down fields and blah, blah, blah. So I know as soon as I told my boss that, three weeks later, I had a warning letter. I already knew I was being out, ousted from the company. What? Yeah. You know, when you get pregnant, okay, I don't know. And maybe you don't know. The first thing is you know you have to find another job mm-hmm. because if a company can do without you for those three or four months or wherever you go, even going back, you feel some type of way. And yeah. this is also coming from my best friend, Chico, who had a baby and she had to leave that job. Mm-hmm. So three weeks later, I have a warning letter and I'm like, okay, I can see what is happening here. Uh, I think five, six weeks later, I have a second warning letter. Mm-hmm. So I can see she's just trying to push me out. I met, yeah. I met with some mentors who told me, Ivy, stay strong. She has no right to actually fire you. Just stay strong, work hard. Don't do anything to to uh, make her mad, which is why, again, remember, I was silenced. So yeah. And she told me, just go for maternity and after you leave, bounce. Mm-hmm. So it affected me in that I was no longer a productive person in that office. Yeah. And I was being reminded every day. Mm-hmm. So that's how it affected my working scenario. Ivy confesses that after she lost her job, her twins then became the drive that pushes her to achieve her dreams of financial security. She says that the twins turned her into a hustler and that she thanks them for making her work as hard as she does now. If there's one lesson I will take from my conversation with Ivy, it's don't sleep on yourself. Ivy shared with me that her vision for her future self is to retire at 42. 42, you guys. I have faith that she can get it done. Now, this episode is just a preview of what you can expect in season one of A Letter to My Younger Self. You can catch all the other episodes by visiting the website listed in the description bar. There, you will find my conversations with my other guests, Chimano, Eli Mwenda, Safia Abdi, Winnie Okoth, Karun, Foywamboy, and Wandia Gishuru. Each guest shares a letter to their younger self, why those moments were impactful in their lives, the lessons they learned, and the vision they have for their future self. Click the link in the description bar to support this podcast and watch season one of A Letter to My Younger Self. Thank you so much for listening, and as usual, remember to work hard, have good intentions, and most importantly, to trust the process.